This program is intended for mature audiences. Parental discretion is advised. Oh, yeah. Here we are. Welcome to the Comic Kid 84 Network. This is NWO Programming coming at you live on a lovely Sunday afternoon. And do I have a show lined up for you, lucky viewer? You know? Because I got myself a fat stack, um, fat stack from the flea market. I did my my flea market digging uh, this morning. I'm going to share those those results with you guys, and and then after that, the action is going to continue rolling on as I share some of the other what if contest entries for you today. That's right, we still have some banging stories, some fantastic what if uh, tales, you know, to go through. And the deadline is cut off, so these are the last of the entries. And we'll see, I don't know if I wanna I don't know if I should just do the randomizer today. I kind of want to make sure I don't leave anybody out and like maybe go through these last ones and like put up a last call to make sure I didn't forget someone or something. I don't know. I think I got everybody. We'll see. We'll we'll play that part by ear, you know? Oh. Um, what's up, party people in the chat in the
Okay. I think I'm back. Okay. Okay, I got confirmation from my phone. We're good. Thank you for bearing with the technical difficulties, y'all. Let's hope that does not happen again anytime soon. I should make this clip that d Runk gave me my background. Watch this. Hold on, backgrounds, check this out. d Runk hooked me up uh, with this new background. So now, if my, uh, if my internet pops out, you'll get this screen. So good looking out on that, D. Appreciate it. Will the Beast Fitness. Good to see you, my friend. Good to see you, my friend. Blowing up on the YouTube scene. Unruly Simeon's in the place to be. D Runk. <laughs> No, no net zero. If you only knew the setup I have, there's some kind of fundamental electric issue in this house is what I'm thinking. I don't think it's equipment wise. I think maybe there's a wiring problem. Uh, Magic Lasso, thanks for joining. Sam I Am. Uh, I heard Joey Bag of Sevens got shouted out there. Yeah, there's Joey Bag of Sevens, Jaguar, A.A. Ron. Oh, yeah. I think we're back in business. Gray Man, James Watson. I think we're back in business, you know, and I'm going to make it worth your while. I'll tell you that right now. So I got my flea market haul. I went to the flea market, bam, armed with, armed with a hundred bucks. I spent, I think I spent 110, Frank, 110 bucks, seeing how far I could get with that. And I'm going to show you that right now. And after that, we're going to get through the remaining what if contest entries. I got some nice. Uh, entries locked and loaded for you now and my man Metarog's in the place to be Zach B the Hawkeye fantastic Count Von Strange tip of the hat to all you and let's get to the good stuff let's get to the comic books that were acquired at the flea market coming up first I snagged up Fantastic Four 348, a very nice copy too. I, th I think I used to have, I had a copy of this, but it was real beat up. And this is a nice, clean copy of the classic Art Adams, new Fantastic Four team. I always thought this team was pretty badass. And Art Adams doing what Art Adams does, man. So yeah, grabbed up FF348. This might uh this might make for a good graders notes issue. Because they definitely were trying to pull some the concept would be interesting on that one. Bill Magnusings. Hello, sir. Good to see you. Uh next up I grabbed this issue of Sam Wilson, Captain America, number 16. I wasn't sure if there was something key about it. Like, I wasn't sure if this meant that Misty Knight took over the Captain America mantle. Um, like when she says about time, is it like about time? Uh, a black woman is Captain America. Is that what was the message here? But I mean, I don't know. I don't think so. I haven't read it yet. And I looked, I looked on like the key collector. It didn't say that this was, that Misty Knight became Captain America. But anyway, 
Uh, I snagged that. In fact, I grabbed two of them because they were only a buck. So I said, look, for a dollar, I'll take two. I really like the cover, regardless of if it was Misty Knight becoming Cap or whatever. I just really dig that, that cover. Bam. Hey, Coach Vic. Good to see you, Vic. I did check Key Collector. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't seem to. I didn't seem to find it. So I'm a little confused by this one. I'm gonna have to do some more research and see what's up. But great cover. Mister Knight looks like a badass. Uh, next up, these are all in good condition. This one seller that I had, he used to own a comic book store, so I guess he kept his stuff in good shape. We got. Galactus, the origin supervillain classic. You know, this is like my second or third copy of this book. When I see it out in the wild for cheap, I can't leave it there, you know? I'm back, baby. Technical difficulties have been addressed. No worries. No worries. <laughs> We're back in action. Okay. Moving on. That didn't happen. <clears throat> um, next up. Next up is this book right here. And we're talking... Uncanny X-Men, number 318. Uncanny X-Men 318. Jubilee, you know, returning back to the team. Or maybe heading out. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But for those that don't know, this here is the first time that... There we go. There we go. The first time we get Generation X. The Generation X team, which was led by Jubilee, begins in this issue. So uh, I figured I'd take that one, that one home. Uncanny 318. Bam. You know, these are all dollar bin pickups, man. I think they're not too bad. Not too bad. Uh, Thor, God of Thunder. Thunder. Uh, a run that I still have not. I have not read this yet, even though I keep, you know, I always hear about the Jason Aaron Thor run is where it's at, you know. And the Jane Foster stuff, I think, is pretty cool, too, from what I hear. But I haven't read it yet, but that's what this is from. And I also have a couple copies of this. This is the first time that you see Old Man Galactus, they call him. Old Man Galactus. So anything Galactus oriented, you know, I need to snag that up. I need doubles. Let's see if we can get a shot of Old Man Galactus. It's also like, uh, man, the art is really good in this. Look at this artwork. I believe this is uh, Esad Ribic. Esad Ribic on the ones and twos doing a very good job. Look at that. Big Galactus introductory panel. Boom. 
see if we can get a more close-up shot of Old Man Galactus. Oh, there's Dario Auger, a.k.a. Minotaur. I think this is the issue that he becomes Minotaur or something like that. But, boom, there's your Old Man Galactus right there. Looking pretty slick. Looking pretty slick. But, yeah, so, you know, as, as far as I was on that stream with Biggie Shack the other day, we were talking about new comic art versus old comic art. And, you know, I gave a good whooping to that She-Hulk book that we looked at. And we were kind of clowning on, you know, modern art in comic books, but not all of it. You know, digital paint, coloring things digitally, you know, could be considered a cheat code to some, but for every like lousy one, you got stuff like Isad Ribic doing his damn thing. You know, the, the problem is that when they get these Isad Ribic type talent, before long, they just relegate them to being a variant artist or a cover artist. And they don't want to pay them to do the interiors like that. You know, it's, it seems like the, the real top talent, like, before you know it, they're just doing covers, you know. But he does great work on the inside. Um, top, top of the pops. What's up, man? Top of the morning to you. Or top of the afternoon to you. Top of the Pops. That was like the UK version of TRL on MTV that we used to watch. Um, I got another Thor God of Thunder issue. This is issue 25. This is the final issue of the run. They reboot this to uh, Thor Volume 7 or something like that. Because this is Jane Foster takes the mantle of Thor at the end of the God of Thunder run. So uh, this is considered like a cameo appearance of Jane Foster Thor. As far as like the key relevance goes, there's that. Next up, next up in this fat stack of flea market books. <clears throat> we have Angela number one, the Asgard assassin. So we're staying on that Thor Norse god theme. And we go from Thor to Thor's sister, Angela. Angela number one. Bang. She's on Rainbow Road. Look at that right there. So pretty cool cover. I think this is the first time that she, Angela joins the Marvel Universe from Image, you know, one of the few moments that an Image character got bought up, you know. And I don't know if this is the first time that Angela sh goes from Image to Marvel or if this is just the first time that she gets her own title. That I'm not sure on. Maybe the chat could let me know. Shout out to my man, my brother, Haya Leah Comic Bro, the luchador extraordinaire. Good to see you, my friend. We're just going through this flea market haul from this morning. We've only been through that many books. And we still have this many books. So just in time, plenty of goodness awaits. And we're going to go through contest entries later. So it's a jam-packed episode. You know, I cleared my schedule to fire this up and just hang out. You know, if my if my internet access will allow me the the fucking privilege to do so. Next up, Cap Wolf. Cap Wolf. Cap Wolf had a three three issue arc. And growing up as a kid, I always had like the, oh, maybe actually a six issue arc. I'm sorry. A six issue arc 
But I think three of those issues take place in Captain America. I might be mixing that up. But, oh, hold on. Sam, I am's giving us an update. Angela Asgard's assassin has great Hans art. Stephanie Hans. Interesting. I'm going to check that out. And he thinks Angela showed up first in Age of Ultron or Guardians of the Galaxy. Okay. Okay. All are in Captain America. Okay. There was, there was an issue of this run. It's the issue after this where it's uh, Captain America in full wolf mode with Wolverine on one side and like another wolf on the other side. I had that book growing up and the one when he's going after Cable, but I never had this one. And I always thought this was the coolest one. So either way, we got Cap Wolf in the house, man. Pretty happy with that. <laughs> Mummy cap was better. Right, right. I think I think this is the first one when he becomes a wolf, maybe. Okay, next up <laughs> Cap from the Black Lagoon. Or maybe Capula, Dracula, Capula. Uh, this next one.
Okay, I'm back. I'm back. Yeah, next time that happens, like Lasso, like aggressively said, I'm just gonna type in the books that are coming up. Like if that, I'm just gonna be like Incredible Hulk. I'm just gonna start typing them. Incredible Hulk 211, and you can just visualize or Google it, and we'll just do an old school text haul. What's up, Mr. Garrel? CFAP's in the house. And YouTube is 90. Made a triumphant appearance. Uh, all right, next up. Before the freaking, before the feds come after my internet again. I just grabbed a stack of hulks. I grabbed a bunch of hulks from a different guy last time, if you recall, right around this area, the mid 100s, the early 200s. So I saw some more and uh, I went with it. So this is 211, 210. These guys are both brain scrambling. He's like stuck in the middle. Hulk, I order you to capture the Maha Yogi and he's mind controlling him there. But this guy saying, man brute, I command you to destroy Dr. Druid. And Hulk's just in the middle of a rock in a hard place. And he's like, both of you stop. You are tearing Hulk's brain apart. So two mind control masters at once competing for the same real estate. Yo, what up, Terry? And also, Geeks and Drinks. What's up, bro? Let's continue on our Hulk haul here. Uh, this one's pretty cool. Number 179, The Incredible Hulk Goes Wild. Boom. Before it was Girls Gone Wild, it was Hulk Gone Wild. Battle of the Brutes. It's a pretty, pretty dynamic cover. I like that. <clears throat> we got some more Hulk for you. Well, look at this guy. Man, they like to use... They use the term Man Brute a lot. Let's look, Battle of the Brutes. On this one. This guy saying, man brute, I command you to destroy Dr. Druid. And this guy, you're finished, man brute. The locust. Look at this villain. The locust. Talk about villain of the week. Bum villain. The locust. He looks like a little more serious version of Arthur from The Tick. <laughs> the Jade Giant. <laughs> um, we got some more Hulk. We're keeping the Hulk train going. Hulk number 241. Half a Hulk is better than none. With a little transformation, two-face action. Looks like it's like the... Tr Looks like it got trimmed. The way it was trimmed, I don't think you know someone did it. I think at the at the printing press, I think they trimmed that one a little close. Let's see, we got a couple more Hulks. I got a nice little Hulk stack, man. Hulk two hundred five, Crypto Man, Crypto Man. He is a. If you guys don't know, Crypto Man was trying to, his power is he can create Bitcoin and Dogecoin. And he was trying to overthrow the U.S. dollar. This was happening way back in the 70s. Crypto Man. He just recently made a comeback. House till the end. C3. Salute. Oh, snap. Who's this guy? Maybe you guys can fill me in. Uh, Hulk 201. 
right? Let the trial by combat begin. This battle, only one of us will survive. Damsel grabbing his leg. But it says, shock follows shock as the Hulk battles the most unexpected barbarian of all. To imply we know who this guy is? Is this like, is this Cull the Conqueror? Um, I don't know who that unexpected barbarian is. <laughs> Getting some good Bitcoin jokes in there. Yeah, I mean, Crypto Man, how could you resist a Bitcoin joke? Okay, last one from the Hulk set is Hulk number 208. These are all like really awesome artwork. A monster in our midst. This is it, the dramatic turning point in the life of Bruce Banner. Very action packed stuff. <laughs> Yo, what? <laughs> Hedge fund the barbarian. Or as Hylia says, it's not Call the Conqueror, it's Zul the Submissive. Damn. The Submissive? Okay, this. Uh, should I show you the biggest score? There was one book that was the biggest score of the bunch. And you know what? I'm not going to save it for the end. I'm just going to slide it right here in the middle. This was the coolest book that I picked up. And boy, did I get it for a nice deal. Um, we're talking about, bam, Journey into Mystery, number 115. Pow. Some early Journey into Mysteries, man. And this issue is the, the origin of Loki. The Lokester, the trickster, origin of Loki. It's not in great shape, you know. Um, I mean, it's okay, but some mofo did some like pen marking on Loki's face there. I barely noticed it at first. <laughs> yeah. Legless Loki is no uh, no torso, just upper body Loki. <laughs> nice, Loki perked his ears up. You're a good boy, Loki. Thanks, ninety. Yeah, I know ninety loves his Hulk and his Thor stuff. I had some Jason Aaron God of Thunder earlier. I remember ninety used to always tell me that that was a primo run. Um, continuing on. That one was not a dollar bin book. I paid a little bit more for that. These next two I found, um, you know who put, was telling me about this book is Justice for Comics. Justice for Comics, he's always got his ear to the street, you know, on hot books and stuff like that. JP Budget, good to see you, sir. And I hadn't heard anyone talk about this book, but I remember uh, Justice for Comics said, Kenny, keep your eye out for this book. Magic the Gathering from Armada Comics, issue number one. This here is, I guess, the first Magic the Gathering appearance in comic book form, you know? Uh, Word on the street is Magic the Gathering is going to be turned into like a series. There's going to be a Magic the Gathering based series. So, you know, he said, keep your eye out for this book. I grabbed two of them uh, because one of them is still in the original poly bag. Still sealed, baby. And one is open. So I got dose. Those copies of Magic the Gathering. Next up, 
Next up is another book that I didn't really know anything about until I saw Biggie Shack posting this book and he told me, I picked up this banger. I said, why is that a banger? He said, first cover appearance of Sam Falcon, Captain America. So I said, okay, cool. So when I came across it in the old dollar bin, I said, why not? He actually had like four copies of these, but I'm like, eh, I don't know if I need four. But I picked out the two best conditioned ones and took them home. <clears throat> okay, next up. Speaking of polybagged, still sealed. You know this thing was sitting on like a, a 7-Eleven rack at a convenience store, or maybe a toy store. But we got X-Men Adventures number one from the animated series. As you can see, uh, Pedigree Gold Collection. And according to the sticker, limited out of print collector's comic. That's right. D loves this book. D represents for this book big time. He's got a graded 9.8 copy. First appearance of Morph, one of D's favorite characters in animated series creation. But yeah, I also have a copy of this book, but I didn't have it in this sweet poly bag thing. Bang. So I thought that was pretty cool. Okay, now. The rest of this haul is rated mature. Okay, or it's at least rated PG-13. I'm going to say PG-13, maybe PG-18. Because the rest of these books, there was a seller there at the flea market who had a pretty nice Vampirella box. And I was like, oh, let me dig into this Vampirella box and... I started plucking away, and I gotta be honest, when I'm going after Vampirella, I'm just looking for cool cover artwork, man. I've read a few Vampirellas. I haven't read many of the the old magazine format. Uh, but anyway, check out these Vampirellas, is the moral of the story. These first three, I was uh, pretty excited to grab. All right, geeks, take it easy. <laughs> Metarog's taking off his glasses just so he doesn't get too good a look. Um, <laughs> that's right. Um, I always had one, this is a three book set and I only had one of them. Uh, so Harris Comics, Vampirella Retro. Issue number one, I mean, as far as cover art goes, look at that. That is a sensational cover. I, this is my, this is probably my favorite of the whole bunch I'm about to show you. That retro number one is Fire, one of three. Number two of three is this one. I, I, I had this one before. Vampirella two of three. The same artist, I would imagine. Damn. And then Vampirella Retro three of three right here. Boom. What's that? 
it looks like her cot. I was like, what's in her hand? I thought it was a stream of blood, but it looks like the top of her costume ripped off. Which, there ain't much costume there to begin with, brother. So, you know what that means. I don't think those are Adam Hughes. Um, it's a guy called Silk. Joey Bag of Seven said, who did the covers? All I can say is that the signature is S-I-L-K-E. Silk. Uh, next up, a Vampirella book that I was not aware of, um, also from Harris Comics. Tell me what you know about a David Mack, a David Mack Vampirella cover with his signature watercolor style, you know. The one and only David Mack. Heart in her hand. Vampirella Strikes, number seven. Pretty cool. I thought that was pretty cool. Jennifer Frizen coming in on this cover. More modern dynamite. Vampirella number three. Jenny Frizen. Pretty cool. Now we're going to get into some Mayhew. Mike Mayhew is, you know, pretty famous for his work on Vampirella. And I want to show you why. Here's number 13. Kind of like a painted style that Mayhew has. Pretty realistic. You know, I think you can tell that he has like photo reference, I think, when he's doing his stuff. Because everything always has a real realistic vibe to it. Issue number 12, which is a pretty cool image there. Got your creatures down low. Number 11. You got Vampirella doing the, the lean. She's almost doing the, the Michael Jackson smooth criminal lean. And you got this dude in the background. So you got Vampy number 11 with the lean. Number nine. Bam. Number eight. Vampirella with bat wings. Okay. Uh, Vampirella fairy tales. Okay, and last but not least, Vampirella Legendary Tales, you know, just hanging out. It looks like she's tied up in like a, a dungeon, but she's still looking pretty sultry in the dungeon. Bam. So... You know, gang, I think not a bad stack, you know, I think pretty much across the board, money well spent, like a nice stack of Vampirellas, Magic the Gatherings, your, your Loki origin. Thanks for stopping in, Wildebeest. Appreciate you. Oh, yeah, I guess I should mention. I did stop in uh, at my LCS. Uh, I forget what day it was. But I popped into my LCS looking for blanks. And I did pick up a couple blanks. Um, matter of fact, because I've been, I've been sketching. You know, I've been doing a lot of sketching. Here's a little Scarlet Witch that I don't really like that much. 
but it's, you know, serviceable. But I went there looking for blanks. But I picked up a couple things while I was there. I finally uh, secured a DC Comics Presents number one, which I was happy to add. You know, I've been kind of piecing together my DC Comics Presents. And the number one, there was a shop that I go to that he has it on the wall, but he's he was asking too much money for it. He wanted like $20 for it. I was trying to resist that. So I snagged it at my at my LCS for cheap. And uh <clears throat> and I grabbed that. Uh a Bruce Tim, you know. It's not my favorite of Bruce. Bruce Tim stuff, but for the price, I took it home anyway. Bruce Tim Spider Gwen, and uh, <laughs> yeah, Lady Eighty Four, Lady Four approves. Lady Four approves. I showed her the, you know. I showed her the concept of naughty and nice variants with that Thundercats Ho comic that I got. I'm like, check these out. Naughty with, you know, scantily clad. No, nice, scantily clad. And I'm like, naughty variant. Tata's out. She seemed to be amused by it. Um, okay. All right, guys. Guess what time it is now. Appreciate you hanging out. We've gone through the flea market hall. And I told you, I've cleared my calendar. I wanted to share that stuff with you. But I also want to share the new contest entries, the remaining contest entries that I've received in the what if do I have a, a little screen thing? Let me see. Let me see if I have some art that assists. We're about to get into a what if contest entry recap session, 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 session. Story time, 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 time. That's right. It's story time. And, uh, I've been doing a lot of yapping. So before we get into story time, let's just get a couple quick words from our sponsors while I hydrate real quick. We'll be right back after these words. All right, ladies and gents. Let's get into it. Oh, come on. As soon as my phone will cooperate. We're going to get into some more what if entries. Oh, here we go. First up. Uh, let me pull up the chat here. I lost the chat for a sec. That's right. It's a what if a thong. <laughs> yeah. Dang monetized channels. I know. I need to get that ad revenue, you know? Um, okay. First up, I'm going to share Biggie Shack's entry. A little Biggie Shack's right here in the chat. And you know what? His what if tale was kind of fitting. I think everyone here knows, but the contest is, you know, submit uh, an original what if story. And that is your entry. So Biggie Shack did just that. 
and his story reads, what if there was a person that started a comic book YouTube channel that had a running theme of their router dying on them all the time? And he would drop valuable books and do tape pulls on books like First Poison Ivy. That's very specific. Even though he paid for the best internet he could get, it would still break down on him. Until he had tried everything, from sweet talking the router, to calling it a pussy. He tried to rewire the router. He used a hammer. He even thought maybe it was bad luck for, <laughs> he even thought maybe it was bad luck for being critical of Jack Kirby art in pushing his Busima agenda. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's a mystery as to why his router was hooked up to McDonald's or his neighbor stole his Wi-Fi. But one day he found a router gremlin sneaking in his basement. And, but as soon as he saw it, it disappeared. Oh, 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 not right now, Joe, not right now. Um, he found a router gremlin sneaking in his basement, but as soon as he saw it, it disappeared. So now, He's trying to tempt the gremlin out with bait, like Slim Jims and comic books to damage, but the gremlin is still on the loose. So the mystery lives on as 84 streams, the router gremlin, which is still unnamed, uh, the description was a bald, tall white man who liked titty books. NWO for life, sincerely the immortal baby shack. <laughs> there you have it. The biggie shack entry is in the mix. Thank you for that, big. You know, give me a little ribbing in there, but it's all fair play. Uh, let's move on to the next. Move on to the next. How about we do 64 page specials entry? You all know 64 page special. He's a prolific contest enterer. And usually he does video entries, but in the spirit of, you know, the contest entry, he did a written, uh, did a written one. And here we go. <clears throat> Let me get myself ready. <laughs> what if John Jones, we're talking Martian man over here. What if John Jones was never found by Dr. Erdell, but was instead found by Lex Luthor? In parentheses, sound like a bore fest? Read on, true believer. Luthor has found out about the Phantom Zone, and he's tried to build himself a Phantom Zone projector to grab a Kryptonian and scam him into fighting Superman. He'll claim he can give the Kryptonian a power suit, which gives him the same superpowers of Superman, but it's actually a red sun suit. And when the red sun power is turned off by a remote in Lex's control, he will just gain Superman's power from the yellow sun. But Lex is taking a chance. He knows there are wild creatures with which he cannot negotiate with in the Phantom Zone. So he's designed this projector to bring forth whatever he finds by stages. He can examine the physiology of the creature he's transporting thanks to an advanced biological scanner. He can cut the power and cut off the transfer, transfer, ripping the cells already coming through the Phantom Zone, killing whatever he finds. Okay. Lex pulls someone in, starts the transfer, 
He's watching the scanner. It's a humanoid, but it's huge. He must be a Kryptonian. But oh shit, it's got a big honking extra chunk on its frontal lobe right there. It's a telepath, and he won't be able to scam a telepath unless he can come up with a massive lie that Lex himself can believe in the next 32 seconds. He lets the transfer continue, and Lex quickly calls his assistant, Mercy Graves, the only person other than Superman knowledgeable of all of Lex's criminal dealings. He tells her that she's fired and that she should come down to the lab to discuss her severance. He checks to make sure the holstered IMI Desert Eagle gun is easy to access under his lab coat. The transfer is complete and there stands John Jones, Martian Manhunter. John Jones says, I talk in your mind for I know not your language. I assure you, I will respect your privacy. Lex tries his hardest not to think. Good, a super, <laughs> Lex tries his hardest not to think. Good, a super powered pussy. Respect my privacy, piss. I'll take this priss over any criminal Kryptonian. He, he thinks to himself, I guess is that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lex says I wanted to find someone as pure of heart and as respectful of boundaries as you we of earth are held under the tyranny of an all powerful alien who calls himself Superman please look into my mind to see what a danger he is and John who's never connected to a non-Martian worldview sees what Lex sees a functional yet oppressed Earth that Superman could destroy in an instant. Just then, Marcy, Marcy, not Marcy, Darcy, Mercy. Just then, Mercy barges in. Lex lets out a yelp, yanks the gun from under his coat and tries to shoot her in the head because Lex doesn't want her to get mind scanned. But her cyborg arm is able to stop it. Lex turns to Martian Manhunter and says, protect me. Martian Manhunter turns into like a zillion razor blades and liquefies Mercy. Red goo splashes and her scratched up cyborg arm clanks to the ground. Manhunter is like, I heard her last thoughts. She was thinking to herself, Lex is a cunt. That sounds just like what an agent of Superman would think, Lex says. <laughs> uh, later, Lex and Manhunter are having tea in Oreos. We humans, says Lex, making an overacting Shatner style hand gesture, can only communicate through language. A limited, a limited system indeed. It makes us susceptible to propaganda, to Superman's lies. Manhunter says, limited, yes, yes, but evolved. One brain atop the other. Yes, let me look up the information. Oh, why look it up when I can just think it at you? Here, catch. Uh, yes, human brains are like Martian brains, with the reptilian part, mammalian part, and higher function parts. But then, we have an either, even higher functioning part, where telepathic abilities rests, and you have a fear of reptiles deep within the workings of your brain. As Martians, we have great fear of fire, but our fear is approximately 85,000 times greater than yours. Well then, Lex says, well then, I'll totally keep any flamethrowers away from you. Seriously, I can be trusted, homie. <laughs> Later, Lex works on something in his lab. Look around the city, learn the language, learn the subtle control Superman holds over everyone. We exist at his whim. Certainly he maintains order and people love him for it, but we pay a far greater price for his protection. And watch out for the most powerful agents of Superman. They'll be flying around with big S's on their chests. They're easy to spot, but don't engage them. So John Morphs goes into the city. <laughs> 
after he morphs into a civilian, Lex says, maybe try to... Oh, uh, Martian Manhunter morphs into Lex Luthor, and he's about to head out into the city. And he says, hey, maybe try someone less conspicuous. John Jones stays the same, but just grows a Hitler mustache. And Lex says, better. Um, John Jones, after having some Crocodile Dundee-style adventures in the city, sees Supergirl, knows he shouldn't engage with her, so he turns invisible. Supergirl flies up to him and asks him why you're hiding. Uh, he says, are you an ally of Superman? She says, duh. The S on my chest definitely doesn't stand for small. P.S. Because she's self-conscious. <laughs> oh, oh <my>. <laughs> Let me say that line again. He rolls up on Supergirl. Sees the S on her chest. Are you an ally of Superman? She goes, duh. The S on my chest doesn't stand for small. Parentheses. Because she's self-conscious about her little titties. Uh, and then Manhunter beats her up. Um, after he beats her up, he heads back to Lex Corp. Uh, da -da -da -da. Hold on, let me, let me streamline it a little later. Okay. All right. John Jones. John Jones fights Superman and kills Superman. Um, but when he kills him, he like mind scans him and sees that he was like an innocent Kansas boy. John, John reverts back to his humanoid form and Cal's body is beside him. A massive crowd has formed. John can understand all of their thoughts. He can feel the worldwide uh, morning. Now that Superman's gone. John can't take it. He screams, transform his arms into a T2 style spike and jams it up his nose, shearing off the front half of his forehead to cut the telepathic abilities from his brain. He flies up to LexCorp Tower and finds Lex strapping himself into a massive green and purple battle suit. Most of the onboard weapons are flamethrowers. Lex says, how can you be mad about a few white lies? Manhunter says, I'm not sure if you know the truth. I'm not sure if you can know the truth, and I don't need telepathic abilities to know what you're planning. No shit, says Lex. And Lex blasts him with a flamethrower. Uh, John's, John's green skin boils and bubbles, but as he gets closer and closer to Luther, he reaches out to touch Lex Luther's face as Lex screams in pain. Outside, the crowd gathers like at the end of Ghostbusters, and out of the burning wreckage steps a battle-damaged Lex, the right side of his face burned. I was able to stop the Martian threat, but falls to his knee, not in time to save Superman. The world mourns. Lex does all he can to rebuild, because plot twist, it's shape-changed Manhunter who will use that dude that comes out is actually shape-shifting Martian Manhunter. He killed Lex, and he's going to use Lex's wealth and his own powers to make amends and right the wrong of killing Superman. The end! Okay? Boom. How we doing, everyone? What's up, Mighty Collectibles? Uh, good to see you guys. Okay. Let's go through a couple more. I'm, I think I'm going to try to do abridged versions of some. Or synopsis, you know. Because <clears throat> it can be kind of difficult to, to read aloud the stories. Um. Shout out to Alex Big Blue. I think Alex Big Blue might be in the chat. Um, Steven Spock. 
Mag Musings, no, you can always rewind for that. Um, it was an interesting story. Yeah, I like the I like the way he laid that out. Alex Big Blue said the story that I'm going to summarize here. I'm going to read you a few lines of it. His story was, well, let me give you the opening line. Raphael, the Ninja Turtle. Raphael is fighting a ton of Foot Clan soldiers. And as they really start to overwhelm him, out of nowhere, two spider webs come out and slam the two guys' heads together. Bam! Cut to the title card. What if Spider-Man and the Ninja Turtles teamed up? That's right. So, Spider-Man rolls up on Raph E.L. Uh, the other turtles show up. Leonardo introduces uh, Spider-Man to the team. Raphael calls him a spider dude. And Spider-Man goes on to tell them how he ended up in their dimension. He was chasing the Green Goblin when a portal opened up and they both went through it. But he lost the Green Goblin shortly after. What's a Green Goblin? Michelangelo asks. Don't interrupt him, says Donatello. Um, the next day, the turtles take Spider-Man to their favorite pizza place. And while they're eating pizza... Um, what happens? While they're eating pizza, Donatello says that Shredder, Krang, Shredder, Krang, Bebop, Rocksteady have teamed up with the Green Goblin, and they got April O'Neil hostage. That's right. So they link up. The turtles are rolling in the turtle van at Times Square. Uh, Casey Jones joins the mix. And they're all squared up in Times Square. Green Goblin says, oh, take a look at the spider and these turtles. Take a look at a spider and a turtle getting led to their slaughter. Ralph says, shut your cake hole, Goblin. Green Goblin throws a pumpkin bomb at them. It landed close, but they dodged it. Um, they beef some more. Meanwhile, Michelangelo and Casey Jones are going back and forth trading blows with Bebop. Donatello's beating up Rocksteady. He trips Rocksteady with his bow staff. Krang is pounding on Spider-Man. Donatello and Michelangelo kick Krang off of Spider-Man. Um, Shredder rolls up. Epic battle while Shredder's running away. Raphael says he escaped. But much to Shredder's surprise, Master Splitter jumps out from behind a building and blasts Shredder with his staff. Spider-Man web slings over and punches Shredder hard enough to knock him out. Turtles, Spider-Man, Casey, Splinter defeated the enemies. Rescue April O'Neil. Jump in the turtle van. And the boys go back to the pizza joint. April says, thanks for rescuing me, guys. Michelangelo says, don't mention it. Donatello says, by the way, Spider-Man, I have built a machine that I believe will get you back to your dimension. And Spider-Man says, that sounds good, Donnie. But first, let's finish these pizzas, huh? They all laugh. The end. Boom. Jackson Roykirk, welcome. So there you have it, the tale of Spider-Man and the Ninja Turtles crossed over. Thank you, Big Blue, for that entry. Let's creep on down to Jaguar X, X, X. I just meant, I was just saying it as an echo, Jaguar X, X, X. I didn't mean to say X, 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 triple X, because Jaguar runs a very straight, straight up channel. No triple X going on there. It's safe. 
<laughs> Jackson. That's right. Okay. Jaguar had a cool one. <laughs> Triple X, baby. <laughs> All right. My boy Jag X. Jag Chicken Tall. All right, man. Buckle up. <clears throat> Call me Manta is the title. Maybe it's a play on Call Me Ishmael, who's another seafaring adventurer. I wouldn't put it past old Jag to, to sow a, a seed like that. Call Me Manta. It's 3.45 a.m. And this is a uh, first-person narrative. Most of the story is first-person narrative of Manta. So you know. <laughs> okay. It's 3.45 a.m. And I ride the waves on the RHIB. Which I think is like a in a an inflatable boat. Only the blackest devils play at this time of night while the sharks sleep beneath the surface. The salted water sprays against my night vision equipped dome helmet. I know it's cold because the temperature is displayed on my HUD, but I don't feel it through the insulated armor. Even without the armor, I don't mind the cold. Sucker. I see the glow of the sea oil rig on the horizon. 20 clicks, ETA, 32 mics. I run a last minute diagnostic on the suit. I ran it several times, but I'm thorough. O2 is go. Helmet OS, go. Mechanical weapons, loaded. Optical plasma cannons, online. All right, ladies, ready your weapons and check your equipment. Sergeant Westbrook is up, says through the comms. Old crusty veteran, leader of a platoon of mercenary men on three different RHIBs, men of fortune. Some call them the Manta Men. They're amphibious specialists, frogmen. Our objective is to infiltrate an oil rig and assassinate. Target is a 49-year-old white male, seven foot one, 556 pounds, an extremely rich man. He made his money in oil and now he had his hands in everything. Telecom, construction, transportation, also in less legitimate practices. Black market rhino horn trade. What? And other exotic species. Also human trafficking. His name? Wilson Fisk, AKA the Kingpin. <laughs> Title card. What if Black Manta crossed over with the Kingpin? Let's <laughs> check in with the chat. You guys with me so far? Okay. Um, he uses the oil rig as a base of offshore operations, far from the eyes of regulation. As we approach the launch point, I dive into the frigid waters, and the frogmen head for the north of the rig. They'll make a fine distraction. I dive into the depths and propel toward the south end, where I can use an elevator shaft to get closer to the tower office where the target is. I cut through the underwater chain link with my Atlantean steel daggers like a hot knife through butter. I hover up the shaft to minimize noise. Everyone who sees me on this rig today will die. At the top of the elevator shaft, there's an engineer welding, unaware of my presence. I insert my dagger at the base of his skull, beneath the welding mask straps. It slides in so easy. Spine, <laughs> damn, spine is severed from the brain. Instant kill. <laughs> we got a graphic murder right there. Alarm start blaring. According to the timeline on my HUD helmet, the frogmen have initiated their attack. Using smoke and full-on ammo, they'll make sure to sound like they're ten times the force they really are. Most of the rig security forces should consolidate to the north. I'm still two flows I'm still two floors below the office, but I'll have to scale the stairwells. I work my way to the stairwell door where the two guards hit the corner. Dag <laughs> dagger to the Dagger through the throat on one guard, and my ha my harpoon fires from my wrist cannon through the chest of guard number two. This shit's too easy. 
The next floor is clear. Keep it moving. I clear corners until I arrive to the office door. Helmet reads six heat sigs in the room, including one very large one. Fist. I move into position around the hall. I plan on entering through the back wall. Optic plasma cannon power level set to 40%. It's time to breach. Bam! He blasts the door. For six seconds, there's a concussive ringing in the room, filled with smoke, smell of burning. I walk through the 15-foot hole in the wall, stepping over the rubble. I twist the handle on my flat. I twist the handle on my flat black baton that telescopically extends into a full trident. Then the groaning starts. I insert the trident into a wounded guard on the floor. Another starts firing at me. I spear the trident into his chest and use the jetpack to boost myself shortly behind to retrieve it. That's a cool visual. Another two guards start to charge as I pull the trident from the fallen guard's chest and launches the trident at one. He's done. I engage the other hand. I engage the other in hand-to-hand -hand combat. A fifth guard, who has finally found his footing, starts to move toward me, and we engage. I fire the cabled harpoon through the torso of the guard in the fight, and its impact hits the running guard behind him. I retract the harpoon until the guards are chest to back, and he fires that plasma cannon. Bow. Okay. Okay, here we go. Confrontation with Fisk. Bam, he's hit with a strong blow. Fisk stands above me. I fire the jetpack to create distance. Black Manta! This is a suicide mission. Who sent you? I'll quadru I will quad <laughs> quadruple. That's a tough word to say. I will quadruple your bounty. I'm here by my own regards, Kingpin. I have come to eviscerate you. So, you are suicidal. I'm going to make Kingpin sound like Bane. So, you are suicidal. Fisk launches a desk at me. My initial instinct is to destroy with the optic plasma cannons, but they're still down. They over.
Oh my God. Bro, when I'm reading these stories, I'm not looking at the screen. I'm just looking at the email. I'm looking at the story. I read that whole thing. I read my heart out on that whole thing. And I'm like, I get to the end and I'm like, the end to be continued. I hop back onto the YouTube screen, StreamYard screen, <laughs> and it's out. I'm like, oh my God, how long have I been enthusiastically reading the story to myself out loud? Ugh. That sucks. Where did it end? I see Bane Pin, so you, you got to where I was like, Reading Kingpin's parts. What a shame. My phone died. I'm ill-equipped. <laughs> Wall breach. Well, all I'll tell you is that it stays action-packed and... He kills Kingpin. He mercs Kingpin. And, and then Mira shows up. With a whirling cyclone of water around her. Blast Manta. And she's like, you're going to pay for what you did to Arthur. And then it says, to be continued. So it ends on a cliffhanger. Uh, it was very well written. I was like, really getting into it. So well done, Jag. Sorry that the internet gods threw a wrench in the telling. Do you guys want me to finish it? Because I, I don't want to do a disservice if you guys were into it. d Rock says, I was at launching a desk. Plasma cannons are still down. I'll, I'll read the rest if you want. How many more do I have? Let's see. While we think about that, I want to give Metarog a shout out. Um, Metarog did an entry, and it's in one of his videos, recent video. And he did a. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right, let me just finish, Jax. <laughs> Let's see. Because I think I was pretty well through it. Um, Fisk launches a desk my way. Okay, here we go. It's right here. I'm going to keep my phone YouTube open here so I can see if the shit hits the fan. Fisk launches a desk my way. My initial instinct is to destroy, hang on. My initial instinct is to, is to destroy with the optic plasma cannons, but they're still down. Shit, I dodged them barely, but before I regain my balance, Fisk charges like a rhino. He hits me like a freight train and I crash through the wall. He starts to punch me in the helmet. The suit can take the damage, but it still hurts. I stab my dagger into his thigh, but he keeps coming. He bear hugs me and starts to constrict my air. I can feel the pressure. I can't move and my ribs feel like they're going to crack one by one. I've always thought the helmet was silly, Manta. Ha ha ha. Ping. Manta hears. That's the sweet sound of death defied. That's the sound of my optoplasma cannons back online. Fisk's hands are interlocked around my waist underneath my jetpack. I fire my jetpack burning his hands, and he feels his grip loosen. I hover above him. Optic plasma cannon set to 100%. Bam! Blast him. Fisk disintegrates in the blast. The blast goes right through the floor, all the way through the building. Uh, the building structurally starts to collapse. Manta's hovering above this building as it collapses. Full gusts of wind competing with crackling thunder in roaring waves. It's a concert of chaos starts to emerge. I land on an open platform 
and examine the destruction of the rig. I take a knee to run diagnostic on my suit. I run a health check. But then, wham! I get blindsided by a wave of water that propels me into a metal post and I drop like a heap of metal. Only it didn't feel like water, it felt like concrete. I look to see a figure approaching me. It's Mira. Her eyes glow with lightning and anger. Water circles around her, loyal in awaiting her command. She speaks, you will pay for what you did to Arthur. Manta thinks to himself, shit, to be continued. Bam, the end. Pretty fire story, pretty fire story, must say. Well done, Jag, well done, Jag. Um, shout out to Metarog's entry, which um, he did on a recent video, and he, because uh, on the last two graders notes ago, um, we did an issue of Demon Hunter, Atlas Seaboard Comics, Demon Hunter. It was a one-shot issue, one-time deal. And Metarog explored the idea of what issue two would be, what the ongoing adventures of Demon Hunter would be. Metarog laid it out fantastic. Before you know it, you got Son of Satan's mixed in, in there. Uh, and it was a lot of, uh, a lot of cool action. You know, him kind of getting folded into the Marvel Universe. It was very cool. It was very enjoyable. I recommend you check that out. Metarob penning the continuing series of Demon Hunter. Which definitely got you in the contest, my friend. Uh, let's see. I think that, and then there was one. And then there was one. I think there's just one more to account for. Um, and then from there, we'll see uh, We'll see if I don't run this randomizer, or maybe if I run it back and do it another time. We'll see how that goes. But for now, let's hit up uh, Mr. Ryan, the magic lasso, who, which was pretty cool, is if you, you know, we're tuned into the first, you know, I, this is the what if contest part two, because I did do, run this kind of contest last year, and uh, this is actually a continuation of his last what if, so. The little background you might want to know on this one is it was like a what if story of what if Lois Lane and Steve Trevor hooked up. There was more to it than that, but that's an important piece that you need to know. And just know that Steve Trevor and Lois Lane hooked up and there's some like animosity to say the least. Uh, between Lois, Lois and Steve in the Justice League. <clears throat> okay. Act one. Let me make sure I'm still online. Yeah, you did miss these. That was on the last time. That was on last time. Okay. D had a great entry. <clears throat> okay. When do you guys message me if my... Uh, actually, I guess I'll see it here if I freeze. I just don't want to <laughs> get caught up in the moment of reading this stuff to a, to a 
disconnected uh, connection. All right. <clears throat> Act one. Time. Lois Lane has lost count of it. How long has she been without her love? The man she married, Steve Trevor. Days, months, a year, more, it all blends together. Every day is the same. His day, his death was also the death of Lois Lane. The reporter who would do anything to get that story, that vibrant, strong woman, seemed so far removed from the woman that looked back her, at herself in the mirror these days. She paid tribute to her love by writing a best-selling biography on Steve Trevor. It paid the bills and allowed her to do what she wanted, let the world know what amazing man he was, while retreating far away from the world, sitting in grief. Whether it was the occasional visit from friends, Batman, or others, she never stopped feeling the pain and the hurt. Whether she visited Steve's grave or sat in a dark room with the only light illuminating from the TV that she was not watching, she knew that he was around. She never saw him, but she could feel his presence looming, and quite often, it's hard to heal when the cause of your pain doesn't leave you alone. Time passes. Lois, the two-year anniversary of Steve's death is next month. What are your plans for that day? Asks her therapist. Uh, she has been seeing Carrie Rogers, licensed psychotherapist specializing in traumatic grief counseling for a few months now and Carrie was proud of the steps that Lois had made. She had opened her mind to the life that was now before her, a life without Steve. My plans for the day, Lois sighed as if to be brave enough to say out loud what she really planned to do. I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask his, his forgiveness on that day, she said. His forgiveness, what is that? Act two, the day arrives. A trip to the cemetery was made and a one-sided conversation was held. It feels different this time when she leaves the cemetery. I know you're there. Just come in so I can talk to you. Lois said it calmly. It had been about an hour since she returned home from the cemetery, and through the open window, he flew in, slowly, cautiously. It was the first time she had actually seen Superman in two years. I'm sorry, Lois, I but she interrupts him. Can you just sit down and listen to what I have to say? Superman. He does. The room fills with an uncomfortable silence. She talks. He listens. She's not even knowing where to start, but she knows how it's going to end. I'm here to ask you for your forgiveness. Superman is shocked at what he's hearing. Lois, what do you have to apologize for? I'm the one who, she interrupts I hated you. By the way, I think, if I remember right, he killed Steve Trevor, uh, I think accidentally at the end of the last story. So she hates Superman. Uh, I'm the one who, she interrupts him. I hated you. I blamed you for what happened to me. You were special to me before Steve. And I just want to say, I'm sorry for hating you. And I'm asking for your forgiveness. Superman is shocked. He waits to make sure she's finished everything she wants to tell him and says, I accept your apology and I hope you can accept mine. I never meant for any of this to happen. She tells him today is not the day for that conversation and she will accept his apology and hopes that someday she can, along with the healing that will come with it. Before he leaves, Superman asks the question that's on his mind. Is this the last time I'll ever see you, Lois? I don't think so, she replies. But just give me some time and give me some space. And we'll see how I feel. He agrees. Thanks her for the invitation and leaves. Uh, though apart, they both sleep better that night than they have in years. Rogers, the therapist, although surprised of the bold step taken to talk to Superman, is proud of Lois for the work that she's done. Act three, more time has passed. If you would have told me I could forgive this man, let alone fall back in love with him, I never would have believed it, Lois says to the therapist. Um, 
How are things with you and Superman going? She asks. Oh, wait a minute. So we got Lois and Superman in a relationship, okay? We're on a solid path. We don't talk about Steve or Wonder Woman, ever. But he does seem happier than he has in years. I think saving people is in his DNA. And once in a while, I can get him to actually leave the fortress to go help out a crisis situation. But he does his thing and leaves as fast as he can, preferring not to be seen or spoken to. Batman approached me to see if they could reform the League, or at least two-thirds of it, uh, and if, if that he would rejoin, I told him it was doubtful. He asked if they would make me the chairperson of the new League, so we'd be working together side by side. Is that something you're interested in, the therapist says? Lois says, I'm flattered, intrigued by the offer, but I don't think the time is right. That would be ill if Lois was in the Justice League. Um, da, da, da. He doesn't spy on me anymore. He respects me enough to give me the space I need when I'm not at the fortress with him. And when you are at the fortress, the therapist says, he seems so happy that I'm there. He just lights up. He's more like the man I first knew. Um, right now, he's teaching me about all the artifacts he's collected. I'm seeing things that are even hard for me to comprehend sometimes. It makes me want to write again. Write a book about these incredible artifacts. Um, therapist session's over. Immediately upon exiting the building, Lois finds herself surrounded by two thugs. Miss Lane, our employer would like to have a word with you, huh? Come with us. She immediately is whisked around the corner and shoved inside of a black stretch limousine. What do you want, Lex? She says, annoyed. Why, Miss Lane, it's what you want. All I have to do is holler, and Superman will be here in a second, and all of this will be... Oh, that's what Lois says. All I have to do is holler, and Superman will be here in a second. Uh, Lex interrupts her. Then I'll come right to the point, Miss Lane. You have access to Superman's fortress. Bring me the magical sphere of destiny. Uh, which is like a magical item. You're crazy, Lex. Why would I do that? Because, Miss Lane, it will make you a very rich woman. And if you don't, I will tell Superman about our conversation a few years ago. You know, right after your precious Steven was slain, you came to me asking if I could build you a super suit to destroy the man who killed your love of the, <laughs> the love of your life, Steve. But you never did. And besides, he'll never believe you, Lois says. Oh, but I bet he will believe this. Lex holds up a phone, incrimination, blackmail of Lois plotting to kill Superman. You have one week. Tramp. I added the tramp part. Kicks her out of the limo. Says, get out of here. And get me that artifact. How are we doing? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, do, do, do. Lois rolls up on her. It's been a week. Do you have what I want? Lex says. Lois nods her head. What is that? She asks Lex. Let's just call it an insurance policy. Lois had a pretty good guess what it was. Keep him talking and walking, Lois thought. It's probably kryptonite. As he walked around the apartment, she stayed on the move as well, remaining always across from him. The magical sphere of destinies in her purse, held tightly to her body. Finally, the opportunity presented itself. When Luther had his back to the window, she knew it was time. Superman, she yelled, in her best damsel in distress voice. It seemed like it only took a second before the Man of Steel arrived in her apartment. She could see the shock on his face, first of Luther being, being there. 
followed immediately by anger for the danger he put the woman he loved in. He immediately puts himself in front of Lois. Lois, are you okay? Superman, he said he's going to kidnap me and torture me. She snitches on Lex. Superman didn't speak and just walked towards Luther. Luther steps backwards, three or four steps before Superman stumbled. Lex is looking on, just as shocked as Superman was, as if watching a man in slow motion tumble to the ground. Lex looks up. Superman turns around to see Lois standing with Lex's lead-lined box open. Four chunks of kryptonite. So Lois is the one that's hitting Superman with the kryptonite. What? He says, Lois, why? Superman could barely speak. His body withered in pain. Because you took the life. Because you took the love of my life away from me. That's why. She, With that, she uses the magical sphere of destiny and stabs Superman, piercing his chest, barely able to speak. The life's draining from his body. Lex is witness to his last words directed at Lois. Superman's last words were to Lois, I loved you. Dead. You're an alien who thought he was a god, and I never loved you. Oh, Lo Lois is gangster. Those were the last words Superman had ever heard. Uh, Lois stabbed him again. Lex is stunned by what he just witnessed. Lois puts the kryptonite back in the lead case, the sphere in her purse, and there's silence as Lex stares at the body of his greatest rival of all time. I just eliminated the biggest problem in your life, Lex. I want my money. With pleasure, Miss Lane. Although I would have preferred to be the one to end the Kryptonian's life myself. Be happy I indulged you to witness my victory. I should use this on you myself, she says. Lex smiles, pushes a few buttons. Money is transferred to her account. Miss Lane, I never realized what a great team we make. Team, I accomplished what you, I accomplished what you and a dozen supervillains could never do. You think I trust you? Hardly. You act like I'm stupid enough not to know. You put my therapist up to feeding you information about me. You have no regard for anyone else's feelings but your own. You're sick and you disgust me, sir. A good day, sir. Make no mistake, Luther. I'm in charge here and you'll never be a problem for me, sucker. She confidently states, is that so, Miss Lane? What are you going to do? I just killed your biggest protector. Luther laughs. What am I going to do? I'm going to do this. Lois's snatch. Oh, wait, no. Not Lois's snatch. Lois snatches the phone from Luther's hand. She stuffs it in her pocket quickly and falls down on the ground on top of Superman's body and screams in pain. Lex is shocked by this complete heel turn that he's witnessed. He leans over, trying to get the phone back from her. Sobbing as hard as she can, leaning over Superman's dead body, Lois screams, Kara. <clears throat> With that, in one blink of an eye, the maid of might, Supergirl, appears. She pushes, pushes Lex Luthor off of Lois, um, tries to help Superman, Oh, this is twisted. She pushes uh, Lex off of Lois, sees the dying Superman or dead Superman, and says, what happened? Lois says, Lex killed him. Ooh, what a trifling little Lois Lane. She says, Lex killed him. Uh, she knew that Kara reacts fast without thinking things through. There's not a moment for Lex to say a word as Kara turns towards him and fires off a blast of heat vision. Where once a living being stood is now just hot ash. Supergirl melted Lex Luthor. Lois is playing up the hysterics. Please, no, I can't lose him. I can't lose him. She's crying. But it's too late. 
uh, then Lois pulls the crypt the kryptonite out again. The result: Kara falls on her side, feeling the kryptonite stabbed into her back. It's nothing personal, Kara says. Lois in a stone cold voice. It's nothing personal, Kara. Stone cold voice. Get it? Lois three sixteen says, "I just stabbed your ass." And that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> uh, it's nothing personal, Kara, says Lois in a stone cold voice. No emotion. If I didn't do this, I'd have to watch my back for the rest of my life in fear of you finding out what really happened here. <laughs> Lois says. Um, Lois stops to take a moment to survey what has gone down so fast. She was responsible for deaths of the two most important people on the planet. Lex Luthor is now nothing more than ash that she'll sweep up and deposit into the building's incinerator. Talk about having a scoop of the century and not being able to write about it. Okay. Then she has to make a phone call where she delivers an Academy Award winning performance of a woman in grief. She tells Batman about the fatal attacks in the vicious slaying of Superman and Supergirl. Who did this, Batman said. He demands to know so he can vindicate his friends. And with no hesitation, what does Lois say when asked the question, who did this by Batman? She says, it was Wonder Woman, Batman. It was Wonder Woman, Batman. She's out here framing everybody. Double crossing everybody. It wasn't all that long ago that a woman stood in front of a grave asking for forgiveness for the man she was married to. A marriage that lasted minutes because of these so called superheroes. She hoped she would understand what she was about to do. And the behavior he would see from her was for a purpose. Uh, now, this same woman has countless financial resources at her disposal. Uh, she crushed not only the life, but the heart and soul of the man who killed her husband. She eliminated the person who would have sought to avenge the death. And she thinks to herself, the Amazonian has no idea what's coming her way. The end, question mark? The end, question mark. Because we're setting ourselves up for Lois V. Wonder Woman. Lasso. I mean, let me jump back to the to the chat here. Lasso. I mean, this was good stuff. This was. It tied to his last one. Um, because if you know, and I think you guys know that, or get the sense, his first what if story was. Lois Lane and Steve Trevor are an item, but in the midst of a superhero battle that Superman and Wonder Woman are involved in, Steve Trevor gets killed, and Lois is resentful of that. And it was the end. He ended his last story with, like, Lois was going to vow revenge on them. And boom, this one we see, wow, very... Very interesting, double crossing, plotting, Lois, straight super villain mode. I mean, very dastardly. The long con on Superman. Hooked up with him. Let me follow, just check in on the chat. Uh, <laughs> Biggie said, what did you say, Big? I'd rather want my girl to kill me instead of my arch enemy. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah, hey, collectible paper. It seemed like everyone was enjoying. Sounds just like Lex. He would sell his mom to get to Clark. Yep, true that. What's up, Ben Compton? 
<laughs> Simeon knew it. Major twist. Yep, that must have been the reveal when Lois is the one that unleashes the kryptonite. I think he's asking about trust issues. <laughs> that was just a good old fashioned story of vengeance. What's up, House? Lois is a beast. True. Oh, that's a cool title. Lois, the Mad Queen of Metropolis. That's dope. Oh, no, really? I don't like to hear that. I got to take my second dose next week. But, you know, fear not. My my mom took both doses. And uh, she, she reacted fine. Boom, there we have it. Um, yeah, what do, what do you guys think? Should I... Um, should I end this stream by randomizing the winner of the slab? Because I have the list. Um, that was all the people that I shared their thing on the first video. And these were the ones that I did on the second video. And I think that's everybody. I think that's everybody. Um, the tough part is, I don't know, because there was two prizes. This one's going to, the Mac Daddy, I'm just going to put in a randomizer, you know. Um, the other one, I said I was going to you know, do a pick my favorite. And that one was just like, you can, I'll give you a few options of a blank cover and you can make like a request on, on what you want on it and I'll do it. Uh, that one, I don't know. I don't know that one. I gotta digest that a little bit. Uh, let me get the the thing going here. Let's see. Random uh, or Because for, to pick the, the best, or not the best, to pick my favorite, that's going to be tricky. Let me share the screen so you guys can watch me uh, type in. The names, so as you have some visual assistance here. That flea market hall was pretty good too, huh? All right, let's get these names in here. So, in the list <clears throat> was D Rump, who had a great fantastic entry in uh, what if Superman landed on Marvel Earth 616 that one was in my that one's in my list of favorites we had Nova Mad who had a cool like alternate Superman origin story Unruly Simeon with uh, Aunt May becoming the White Widow getting spider powers that was one of my favorites Paper. Uh, paper, I think. Oh, no problem, Lasso. Dude, thank you so much for putting 
all that effort into your entry. Uh, appreciate it. Have fun on your next stream, bro. And you can let us know what it is because I'm going to wrap up soon. I think he's being polite and not like saying, hey, I'm going to this other one. But you can let us know where you're going. I'm sure we'd be happy to check you out, bro. I'll only be on for 10 more minutes as I raffle this baby off. Uh, collectible paper. I think yours was related to like, what if uh, John Favreau didn't do Iron Man? Dark Madness was a chat, a comment entry. Buddy Chris Gerard entered. Super Russ. I can't think of Super Russ is. Geeks and Drinks had the Batman vs. Carnage. Comic Book Fever. Did a video entry. Metarog with the Demon Slayer. Piggy Shack with the What if Comic Kid 84 had a gremlin messing with his router story? <laughs> Alex Big Blue with the Ninja Turtles crossover with Spider Man. Magic Lasso. 64 page special with the awesome John Jones Martian Manhunter story. <clears throat> and Jaguar X with the badass. Mercenary, you're a good writer. Um, I was expecting something to be well written uh, from you. I wasn't surprised that it was as well written as as it was. Jag, that shit was good. It had good pace. You paint the picture well. <laughs> yeah, Batman adjusts his junk. Yeah, geeks. Threw that in like three times. I'm like, Batman adjusted his joke like three times in your story. <laughs> uh, comic Collector's Channel. Fanboys Live. Okay, cool. Yeah, Tim the Comic Collector. Shout out to him. Tim's the man. He's a big Graders Note supporter. So after here, check out the boys. All right, man. So here's the list. Again, I, I don't think I'm forgetting anyone. I feel pretty bad if I do, but. I'll make it up to you somehow. There's the list. Okay. Someone on this list is going to be the new owner of that slab. Uh, how many names are on this list? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Uh, let's see, 15 divided by 2 is 7.5. So let's say 7. We're going to roll this dice. 7. Run it 15 times. Yeah, I mean, there was 15 entries. I thought 15 might be too long, but 15 entries 15 times. Let's do it. I like that. 15 entries 15 times. Check. Number one. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Lasso's in there. Lasso is number nine right now on the list. Which is also how many times we've randomized. So let's go on to number ten. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. Oh, we're getting there. 
13. There's only one person on here that I don't know. The only person I don't know is Dark Madness. Here we go. All right, guys. Moment of truth. The winner of the What If Slab. Thank you for entering. Is oh, <laughs> it's D Runk Comics. D Runk Comics. Amazing turn of events. D Runk Comics. Let's zoom that in for the people in the back. <laughs> He says, "I fucking right." Nice. Congrats, D. On the win. It's a pretty slick book, man. Pretty slick book. What if Wolverine killed the Hulk? 9.4. Custom Wolverine label. Papow. Good on you, D. Thank you for entering. Um, oh, man. Do I have to... Um, you know, I probably got to make a decision. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to chump out and say, well, I'll think about which one is the, my favorite and come back to it. I got to face the music. This is obviously a very tough choice. Um, to be honest, I was thinking between, it was between three. For what it's worth, it was between three of the entries that I was thinking we're gonna we're gonna get my favorite story pick, um, and it was Magic Lasso, Jaguar, because uh, it was probably the best. Like, I think, like, maybe the most well-written one might have been Jaguar. It was, like, I was, like, into it. It was very action-paced oriented. Uh, very descriptive. I liked it a lot. And Unruly Simeon. It was going to be between Unruly Simeon, Jaguar, and Lasso for my three faves. And I've just been mulling it over. Because uh, I do, I think Unruly Simeon had one of the best... Uh, what do you call it? Premises. You know, for a what if story. Like, I feel like it was quintessential what if. Because a what if story is like, has, has one twist in it that changes the dynamic of the landscape, you know? And, uh, it was very simple. What if Aunt May got bit by the spider? And then to go with the white widow angle from there was very clever. Ripping off the heads of the victims. I thought it was funny. It was just a killer. It was like quintessential what if, you know. And maybe, uh, yeah, and Jag, you know, so it was, it was definitely a badass what if story. I guess didn't have that hook. Uh, Lasso's, damn. Lasso's connected it to his last years. That one's tough to beat. Yeah, I think, you know what I think I'm going to do? My top three, just give me, all you got to do is just give me, let's do this. Because all we're talking is a sketch cover commission, right? Which I've been doing a bunch lately. Um, have I showed you all of them? 
I've been I've been going nuts. I've been going nuts. I did my Sandman, uh, my bl zombie Black Widow, my zombie Black Panther, zombie Doctor Strange, Scarlet Witch. So I'll be banging them out anyway. So, yeah, why don't, uh, here's what we're going to do. Jag, I know Jag likes Black Panther. So, Jag, I'm going to send you the zombie-fied Walking Dead Black Panther sketch cover. Bam. So you get zombified Black Panther. Um, Unruly Simeon. Oh, good. Unruly Simeon likes the Doctor Strange one. Unruly Simeon, you get the Doctor Strange one. Bam. And then for Magic Lasso, I'll see if he... I'll give him the choice. I'll... Either if he wants one of these two, or I'll give him a couple choices. I do have a Wonder Woman blank. I think he might want that. Boom. So how about that? My top three will just all get uh, sketch covers. Boom. It's a win. Nice. Because when I do these, I don't really have a plan for them. So There we go. Simeon. Jag. All right, long stream session, but you know we did it. Contest entries, flea market hall. Maybe I'll have to timestamp this video for people if they want to rewatch it. And uh, that was it. Thanks everyone for hanging out. Appreciate it. Had a nice little Sunday evening here with you guys. Congrats, D Runk on the slab, dude. Everyone's winning when 84 does a contest. All right, y'all. Have a great night. Rest up before the beginning of your week. I hope you start your Monday morning ready to, to dominate the week. Put a pep in your step. Till then, folks. Adios. Bye.